And I knew him before he had gray hair, both <laughs> friends of which are irreversible. So. <laughs> uh, Gabriel came here in uh, 1988 uh, out of the University, uh, American University of Beirut in Lebanon and walked in my lab and said, how come you don't have any magnetic tape drives? And by that time, we were already up to 1.44 meg floppy plastic drives, so we, we were way ahead. And, um, but he reminded me last night that we did have still magnetic tape drives on uh, Campbell Scientific microloggers out in the field. And so you could actually hear the data if you uh, played with the volume on it. Um, and so uh, we go back quite a long ways and I've been uh, just so happy to watch the uh, progress of Gabriel's uh, career. He uh, uh, finished his MS here uh, at OSU and then uh, Mark Parlange, uh, who I knew as a new faculty member at UC Davis, was just starting at UC Davis, had no grad students, and uh, I had gone and done my PhD at Davis, worked with Lysander there, and there was some opportunities that we could put together, and so Gabriel was, had a great opportunity to be first, uh, first grad student for Mark Parlange. Uh, he is the current, uh, and this is a tag team introduction, and, and Chad's going to tell other stories, but uh, uh, Dr. Katul is the current Hydrologic Sciences Award winner for the American Geophysical Union. That award was granted in uh, December, and so we're very, very pleased and proud to have him here. It's your turn. Okay, it's my turn. Um, uh, I will do the announcements first. Um, sign in. If you're in the class or not, it helps us keep a nice room to show that we've got uh, lots of people. Um, today is the last day to register for the Water Research Symposium. That's going to happen, I believe, in two or three weeks, Allie? The 13th. The 13th, May 13th, so it's two weeks from today. And uh, of course, don't forget there's a reception following the talk today, as there is every week. You're not special in that But you are special in that you get two introductions, which is how you know something <laughs> special is going to happen. Uh, uh, and, and I won't bore you with, with Gabby's uh, accolades because there's just too many. Uh, but I will, I will uh, tell you two, uh, two stories of how Gabby's name came up with, uh, in conversation with me, unrelated to the fact that we've known each other for a while now by having common advisors. Um, let's see. What's the best one? Gabby-esque? We were going to coin the term Gabby-esque to describe something, but that might not be the best one. Um, Work-life balance. You know, uh, it's nice to have a comparator when someone at home is saying you work too much. And um, Gabby is my my inspiration in that way because I can always point to him and say this guy is working harder than me. <laughs> so you know you shouldn't you shouldn't you shouldn't worry about it because there are people out out in the world that are that are more dedicated. And, um, and I don't think there are many that are more dedicated than Gabby. So I've, I've invoked the name Katul to get out of certain problems. Um, and and as, a, as a new professor, I, actually, I surveyed around people um, across hydrology and asked, you know, what should I do to get tenure? And uh, a range of you know, opinions are like other something, and um, everybody has one. And, and uh, one person in particular had the nuggets that, that was pertinent today. They, they told me, you know, all I, it's easy. Tenure is easy. All you have to do is be a productive genius. You know, like Gabby Chikatul. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, of course, uh, no one can do that but Gabby, because there's only one Gabby, and we have him here today. So, Gabby, welcome. It's nice to have you. Well, thank you all for, for being here. It's, it's actually great to be back and see the developments on campus that has happened. I do have a few corrections on Richard Cuenca's assessment. In fact, you could reverse the hair gray. It's, it just needs external work. <laughs> so thermodynamically, it cannot be done. But if you put extra work, it can do. And it's called bleaching. So <laughs> and uh, thanks, Chad, for the. <laughs> Um, okay, so to start the talk, let me see if we can get the slideshow operational. I don't use PowerPoint a lot, so... Oh, 
Got it. So this work is done uh, with my collaborator, Ram Oren, from the Nicholas School of the Environment, and my former PhD student, Sally Thompson, who is at UC Berkeley. And the motivation for this talk comes about from the fact that land plants appeared in the fossil record some 500 million years ago, uh, presumably uh, of evolving from aquatic algae. And when they started uh, basically um, living on the planet, uh, the Earth, the terrestrial system, uh, they had two major challenges to confront uh, to survive. Uh, the first one is, of course, they had to adapt to uh, an environment that was pretty much desiccated. And uh, the dry environment uh, poses a major challenge for them because for them to photosynthesize, they need a water delivery system. Basically, they need an engineering solution to take water from the soil and put it at the photosynthetic sites where, where CO2 is being exchanged with the atmosphere. The other problem that we will not be talking about much, uh, has, even though it might be more interesting, it has to do with the uh, reproductive agents. Uh, you know, air is much lower density than water. Uh, you have you need to spread pollen, and that posed, uh, uh, the pollen was the solution to be able to reproduce in land, and that was not a big issue for uh, algae in, in, in water. So we will be primarily focusing on the first one, and we will be touching a little bit upon the second one later in the talk. So as plants started adapting to their terrestrial environment, they uh, changed fundamentally their structure. So their structure um, evolved quite differently from, from their aquatic origins. Uh, they, in fact, started putting leaves, uh, and then the canopy started growing so that they can optimize light interception to, to proceed with their photosynthesis and outcompete their neighbors. And that actually promoted a race upward in the system. And in fact, now we have species uh, that have crowns that are bigger than 100 meters. Um, some of them are not too far from here, <laughs> California. And of course, the higher distances, if you happen to use wind uh, as a dispersal agent, uh, the higher distances allow you actually to disperse, the higher, the higher elevations allow you to disperse further and further away from your parent source, so that gives you some reproductive advantage. Uh, so the primary focus on this talk is that we're going to try to see uh, the relation between structure and function of organisms and ecosystems in response to the first major challenge. In other words, as plants started having to engineer solutions to deliver water to the leaves, uh, clearly, there is a hydraulic, hydraulic uh, signature here, and this hydraulic signature perhaps can be seen in the structure of the roots, the structure of above ground uh, biomass distribution. Even if you start focusing a little bit more on the leaf, there is a quite bit of work on leaf venation now, so that you are delivering water to stomata that itself is distributed in, in a specific way on the leaf surface. And so there is clearly some signature of the structure of of the tree system uh, basically to try to enhance its hydraulic efficiency to deliver water to the sites where photosynthesis has occurred. And so we're going to look at that first and then we're going to try to look at a similar problem but rather than focus vertically on, on the race upwards, we're going to try to look at the horizontal distribution of biomass when the resource that is limiting is no longer light but water. So this way we cover the two end members of water and light. Now, of course, these are topics that are of interest in eco-hydrology. There is quite a bit of work that has been done in physiology. And perhaps to borrow some statements from Murray, who uh, developed Murray's law in 1926, he actually noted that uh, physiological organization, he stated, this is a quotation from his paper, uh, like gravitation, is a stubborn fact. And it is one of the tasks of theoretical physiology to find quantitative laws which describe organization in its various aspects. And basically, that's where we are in, in eco-physiology and, and eco-hydrology is we really need to try to think of ways to put the spatial organization uh, into some quantitative law and be able to take advantage of the fact that there is a coherent structure in the system that allows us to predict uh, function, fluxes, carbon uptake, and so forth. So far, we've been surrogating a lot of that to resistor analogies that really miss the fundamental structure, the geometric structure of the problem. Uh, so here the hypothesis is that hydraulics do constrain the function, in this case carbon sequestration when explicitly tied to carbon-water relations, of many ecological processes, and thereby it is generating specific structural forms on long time scales, such as vessel diameter relations across branching order or spatial organization of biomass on land. Uh, 
And so to motivate this topic, I'm going to start with a brief review of photosynthesis with an eye towards what's happening at the leaf and introduce a few things about the stomatal optimization theories. Uh, these are almost macroscopic relations at the finest scale we will be interested in, which is the leaf scale, and then put those into uh, scaling relations between the radii of vessels across various branching order in organisms and the flow rate that is being transmitted through a network like that. And this is basically dealing with the issue of the race upwards. Then what we're going to do in the last part of the talk is discuss spatial organization of biomass on the landscape and the spatial patterning that would emerge because of hydraulic limitations. So just a brief review of photosynthesis. This is just a, a, a a quick survey. Uh, the leaf scale equations that we will be using, well, uh, Francis Darwin already in 1898 noted that transpiration is stomatal rather than curticular. This is a quotation from the paper itself. Uh, so that other things being equal, the yield of watery vapor depends on the degree to which stomata is open and may be used as an index to their condition. So basically the question is what drives the opening? Uh, and by the way, you still find Day with those conclusions, just. <laughs> um, so, so basically, what drives uh, what drives stomatal opening is is now much better understood. Uh, it's photosynthesis. Plants open stomata to harvest CO2, that then, when combined with water and light, produces sugar and oxygen. And that reaction, of course, is temperature sensitive. And so typically, uh, the photosynthetic rate is uh, depending on which limits. If there is no light, that would be the limiting rate. If there is low temperature or very high temperatures, that would be the limiting rate. And there is, of course, a sucrose limitation, but that is really um, relevant here. And the mathematical form for this relation between photosynthesis and the internal concentration in the leaf is often described by the so-called Farquhar photosynthesis model. This links photosynthesis to the intercellular concentration through a saturation function. And the coefficients alpha 1 and alpha 2 that you see here vary with light or temperature, depending on what limits photosynthesis. Okay. So far, so good. So basically, we can view uh, this expression as a description of the biochemical demand for CO2. Where is that CO2 coming from? Well, that CO2 is coming from the atmosphere. Okay, so it's being supplied to the atmosphere. And if you have steady state conditions where the demand is balanced by the supply, uh, then basically you have two equations for photosynthesis. The first one which links photosynthesis to internal CO2 concentration and the second one which links photosynthesis also to CO2 concentration assuming we know the atmospheric CO2 concentration and the two parameters alpha 1 and alpha 2 that vary with light or temperature. Two equations and three unknowns, we have a mathematical problem. We need to close the system somehow. It's not enough. So just by looking at the biochemical demand and physics this is one expression of mass transfer, Vickian diffusion, uh, the problem is still not tractable. And that's almost the essence of uh, the issues that we have to deal with in, in ecophysiology. Okay, so one closure idea uh, is uh, due to Paul Jarvis, uh, who proposed as early as 1976 some sort of an organizing framework where the stomatal conductance, this unknown, normalized by some maximum value, is a whole function of a set of parameters, uh, photosynthetically active radiation, vapor pressure deficit, leaf pressure, atmospheric CO2, there is also temperature, and so forth. And this is very common. If you ever took a course with Richard Cuenca about the universal soil loss equation in erosion, you find that the equation is almost identical. You have some rate normalized by some maximum theoretical value, and then there's a whole bunch of reduction functions that apply to this rate that often represent limiting factors. And the challenge is first to identify those limiting factors. So to the credit of Paul Jarvis, he was right on in terms of picking them all up. And in fact, this work helped organize species into temperature sensitive, drought, drought resistant, and so forth. So in fact, that organization was very helpful to put a lot of pieces of data sets together and make better understanding of groups, physiological groups that operate in a certain way. Of course, when you do that, you are missing any synergistic interactions between the variables. So it's very rare that, for, the, for example, PAR and VPD are independent of each other. Okay? Due to the diurnal cycle, they do, are, they do vary with each other. Uh, 
So this was basically one way to think about the problem and that could actually be posed as a closure problem now that you know the external drivers, the stimulus drivers from the environment, par, VPD, leaf pressure and CO2 concentration, you multiply that by some maximum theoretical value that you could envision the plant open. Did you get that Richard? <laughs> Uh, then the stomatal conductance becomes uh, deterministic and we have three equations and three unknowns. So I just want to mention this for Paul Jarvis, he recently passed, passed away, but the work of his 1976 papers is still being cited uh, enormously. And uh, there are other developments that have happened since 1976. I'm simply putting two of them uh, just simply due to the fact that they have been used extensively in climate models. One of them was developed by, by Ball and Berry, uh, perhaps uh, elaborated upon in the paper by Collatz in 1991, where they said, well, stomata ought to open uh, because it is responding to photosynthesis. So there ought to be some sort of a correlation between stomatal conductance and photosynthesis normalized by atmospheric CO2. And basically they argued that this relation is linear. They added relative humidity as a scaling variable. Uh, the argument there was that if relative humidity is low, this relation is weak. If the relative humidity is high, this relation is high. And in fact, the Ball and Berry was the first model that was put in the climate models of 1995. And uh, this was the era of greening of GCMs. And in fact, uh, Sellers has a very nice paper that shows the physiological effects versus the radiative effects when you look at doubling of CO2 using these types of models. And since then, these models are the basis of, in fact, dynamic vegetation models in general circulation models or climate models. Liuning in 1995 had a nice paper in Plant Cell and Environment that was a little bit critical of Ballberry because of the relative humidity effect. And he basically suggested a vapor pressure deficit a signature rather than a relative humidity signature, perhaps more physiologically meaningful than relative humidity. While these developments were occurring, uh, Cowan and Farquhar in 1977, but even before that, Cowan in 1971 had a very, very interesting paper that put a lot of ideas together. And then Givnish in 1976 had a wonderful paper in, in Amnat in 1976 with a very strange title about the leaf and shape of lianas, but in fact it also laid out the mathematical machinery of stomatal optimization. And in it, what Cowan argued was that stomatal conductance may be viewed as some sort of a compromise between the need to bring CO2 into the plant and to limit your losses of water vapor to the atmosphere, to the desiccating atmosphere around you. And uh, with that basically idea, one can think of the problem as an optimization problem. So you could define your carbon gain as the photosynthesis into the leaf, where CO2 is high in the atmosphere and low inside the, the substomatal cavity. And of course, when you open the stomata to get that CO2, you lose water vapor. And so you would like to devise an optimum aperture yeah, of your stomates so that you could maximize your carbon gain while minimizing your water losses. So how do you do that? Well, the way you do that in, uh, in engineering is you define an objective function, in this case, to maximize your carbon gain over a certain time period t. This optimization has to be uh, constrained, and it is constrained typically by moisture availability. So the problem becomes a constrained optimization, and the mathematical trick to solve constrained optimization problems is to make them unconstrained. Okay? And the way you do that is you do that through the Lagrange multiplier approach. You basically define a Hamiltonian where you lump the constraint in this Hamiltonian through a Lagrange multiplier. And so now basically your Hamiltonian is maximizing your carbon gain minus the cost basically of water loss to the plant in units of carbon and that is often referred to as the marginal water use efficiency. And so maximizing this Hamiltonian with respect to the control variable, and what does the plant control? It controls its stomatal aperture, so it controls basically its stomatal conductance. So uh, the idea then is you maximize this Hamiltonian with respect to the control variable. What we are assuming here is the control variable being the stomatal aperture. That of course translates to stomatal conductance. That has to be maximized. So now, with this hypothesis, so th this may not be exact, but with this hypothesis, we have now three equations and three unknowns. We have the biochemical demand function from the Farquhar model that links photosynthesis to internal CO2 concentration, where alpha 1 and alpha 2 simply dictate whether the photosynthesis is light or temperature limited. 
The second one is basically mass transfer. You have photosynthesis now proportional to this stomatal conductance multiplied by the difference between atmospheric CO2 concentration and internal CO2 concentration. So these are our original two equations with three unknowns. And the optimality hypothesis is providing you with a closure model. Yeah, it's a model. The plants may not be exactly operating like this, but it's a closure model that allows you to close mathematically now the system without invoking a specific functional relationship between the stomatal conductance, photosynthesis, or its environment. Yeah? So it's, it's supposed to be a little bit more general than a particular application to one data set. And the idea there is that you could uh, formulate uh, this uh, optimization hypothesis now by maximizing the Hamiltonian with respect to the conductance, which in this case simply means differentiating the photosynthesis when framed as a function of conductance only, minus the water vapor loss framed as a function of conductance. So now the control variable appears in both the gain and the cost. You differentiate that with respect to the conductance, set it to zero, problem solved. That introduces, of course, one unknown, which is the Lagrange multiplier. And here it is assumed that the Lagrange multiplier is changing at a time scale that is much slower than the fluctuations in stomata. Okay? So stomata opens and closes on short time scales. Say the cost of water will go up if you have drier soil because of water availability is lower. The Lagrange multiplier becomes higher because water becomes more expensive if there is less of it. But that change is occurring on time scales that are diurnal, not very fast. Okay? So with that, you could solve the system analytically, and this has been done in a paper in 2010. Now, the expressions that come out from this analytical solution are a little bit lengthy for the nonlinear version of the biochemical demand function. Just to highlight the nature of the solution, I'm going to linearize this function and illustrate a few interesting things that will then allow us to wrap back to the Ballberry and Lelyuning models. And to do that, what you could do is uh, argue that if you have enough light, so Robisco is the primary limitation now, this quantity alpha 2 turns out to be uh, fairly large, comparable to CI if not bigger, and hence that allows us to linearize the CI in the denominator only as some sort of a long-term CI over CA multiplied by CA. So I'm going to simply call S as a long-term CI over CA value, and uh, that quantity does not vary a lot for C3 species, uh, and so it, it is actually not a bad approximation to, to start with. Of course, this approximation becomes poorer if light is limiting photosynthesis because alpha 2 in the case of light limitation becomes very small. Okay, so this is not you. This was done by Hari and co-workers and Lloyd. But uh, the interesting thing is that if you now compare CA with this linearized demand function, it is nonlinear with stomatal conductance. And in fact, that expression fits quite a bit many data sets. As you can see on the figure, stomatal conductance is on the x-axis, CI over CA is on the y-axis. So it preserves the nonlinearity between CI over CA and stomatal conductance. And if you express now the photosynthesis as a function of stomatal conductance only for this linearized biochemical demand function, you still have a saturation function with respect to stomatal conductance, and you do not lose the nonlinearity of photosynthesis with respect to CO2 concentration. That expression is still nonlinear in CO2 concentration. It's a saturation function of CO2. You increase CO2 more, the photosynthesis simply increases nonlinearly as a saturated function with respect to CA. Now, if we maximize this Hamiltonian for this linearized demand function, and you have the water loss, which is nothing but the conductance multiplied by vapor pressure deficit, multiplied by a conversion factor for the differences in diffusivities between CO2 and water vapor, and you solve this linearized version, you end up with very simplified analytical solutions for the stomatal conductance, CI over CA, and photosynthesis. And these expressions, of course, depend on alpha 1 and alpha 2, so whether light limits or, or Robisco limits becomes important. And more important, you get explicit expressions now with respect to CA, vapor pressure deficit, and the Lagrange multiplier. It also gives you an estimate of CI over CA that is now nonlinearly related to vapor pressure deficit. Actually, it varies as square root of vapor pressure deficit. And that is important because with, uh, with stable isotope networks like Basin, it does allow you to infer A over lambda divided by CA. And so it tells you something about the cost of water to the plant that you see. And last, the photosynthesis now is explicitly related to CO2 concentration and vapor pressure deficit, as well as the Lagrange multiplier here that varies slowly with soil moisture. 
If you notice, there is a, a similar term for the photosynthesis and the stomatal conductance, alpha 1 divided by alpha 2 plus SCA. So you could automatically see that we can cancel this term and write an expression between stomatal conductance and photosynthesis. If you do that, you find that the stomatal conductance looks like FC over CA multiplied by CA over A lambda multiplied by D to the minus 1 half. The shape of this function is exactly similar to the ball berry is exactly similar to the Leuning, except that the environmental stimulus here is d to the minus one half, rather than relative humidity or vapor pressure deficit. There was some interesting tests on this uh, done by Sari Palmroth, where Sari actually looked at Scott spine across a climatic gradient in Finland, so the same species, and she actually showed that if you plot transpiration as a function of lambda multiplied by 1.6 multiplied by d under square root multiplied by a, you get a straight line. So rather than look at transpiration, look at conductance, you look at transpiration. So if you multiply the left hand side by vapor pressure deficit, you get a d to the plus one half dependence that is now lumped in the denominator. And so you get a straight line with a constant lambda. There were other variants that suggest similar outcomes. So for example, Belinda Medlin in 2011 presented also a similar derivation where she actually showed that even under light limitation with a slightly different approximation to the ACI curve, you still get a similar result, suggesting that the linearity between conductance and photosynthesis over CA is an emergent property of the optimization. Okay? Likewise, the d to the minus 1 half. So with this background, now we go to the main, main topic which is uh, the delivery of water to these leaves that are photosynthesizing. Okay? So to us, the leaf pressure or soil moisture content are going to affect the Lagrange multiplier, and the ability of the plants to deliver water to them is our next topic. And this has been a topic that has a long history in ecology. It started actually with the work of Leonardo da Vinci, and this is actually the diagram taken. And it's interesting to go back to those notes because the argument that Leonardo did was not a geometric argument. It was actually a hydraulic argument. What Leonardo noticed is that he made the case that if water is flowing through a tree like that, because the volume of water per unit time is conserved, he said that the amount of water that has to pass through here will be split. Yeah? And the sum of the flow rates then at the trunk and at the different levels of branching has to be conserved. Leonardo at that time did not have any clue that there could be a velocity radius dependency. But he made the case that if the velocity, if the currents were the same in his almost translation, then what is actually preserved is the sum of the areas. In other words, at each of those branches, the area of the main trunk is equal to the sum of the two areas. If you go one level higher, is equal to the sum of the four areas. Or stated differently, rather than the area conservation, because area times velocity is flow rate. So if the flow rate is conserved, the velocity is the same. The area sum, but the area is proportional to the square of the radius. And hence, you end up with the so-called Da Vinci rule, okay? that the square of the radius yeah, is preserved across a network. And uh, in fact, this, uh, this law has, has attracted lots of attention. Very recently, the Langry, a very famous fluid mechanics person who studies fluid solid interaction, made the following statement. Leonardo's formula is like Pythagoras' theorem, which is really the case, R squared, <laughs> except that no one had explained it yet. Now, there has been several papers, starting from the work of Murray in 1926, to figure out a similar structure for, for airflow in the lungs. And what he argued was, what Murray argued uh, quite intuitively, is that if you look at a velocity through a pipe, and if the flow is laminar, the velocity through that pipe is, is parabolic. Very well known result. If you have the Navier-Stokes equations and the only two terms that play with each other are the pressure gradients and the viscous terms, no advection, yeah? no transients, no drag forces or other sources and things, the velocity profile ends up being quadratic. So the velocity then varies as the square of the radius. The flow rate is nothing but the velocity times the area. So you would expect that the flow rate will vary to the fourth power of the radius. That means that the pressure drop or the pressure difference across a given length of pipe will vary with the flow rate multiplied by the inverse fourth power of the radius. What Murray then did is he argued that the hydraulic power that you need to move water in the pipe, so this is Richard Cuenca's irrigation systems design, uh, 
basically the work that you need to use to, to, to employ per unit time is the flow rate multiplied by the pressure. This is the mechanical work you need to push water into the pipe. And then simply varies in proportion to the square of the flow rate and the inverse fourth power of the radius. Great, so now if the plants can maximize the radius for a given flow rate, they can survive very happily. But unfortunately, to build big radii, ah, you need uh, to pay for it. And the payment comes in metabolic power. Okay? So one argument that Murray did, which was quite interesting too, is he argued that the metabolic power that you need to construct the system is the solid volume that must be holding, in his case, the air, in our case, the water. And that volume of water that, is, that, that you have to produce is proportional to the volume of water that is being held. So in other words, the solid volume that you have to build is proportional to the volume of water that is stored. This is a little bit iffy, yeah? But let's go with it, as Murray did, okay? So that means that the metabolic power now is proportional to the square of the radius. So now the penalty that you pay for building big radii is proportional to the square of the radius. The hydraulic gain is proportional to the inverse fourth power of the radius. So the total power then is nothing but the sum of the two. You put that in and the first term is the hydraulic power, the second term is the metabolic power. Let me just put them in generic ex scaling exponents just to show you one thing, how plants operate when they're viewed from this lens. Uh, so let's assume that rather than 4 we have m and rather than 2 we have n. So this way we can talk about any generic scaling rules that will pop up later. And so you could say that a network that evolves its radius so as to minimize this total power yeah, would certainly have some competitive evolutionary advantages over other plants. And so you could then ask what happens if we minimize this power with respect to the radius that you are trying to construct on evolutionary time scales. And so if you differentiate the above expression with respect to radius, set it to zero, and solve for the flow rate radius relation, you find that the optimal outcome turns out to be the average of the exponents. In other words, the plant might choose a size that is the average of the gains that you, you ac acquire from hydraulic efficiency and the losses that you incur from metabolic costs. So basically, the plant chooses the midpoint <laughs> of the two exponents. That would be very nice. <laughs> okay. So in the case of Murray, uh, the, what we have shown before is that m is 4 and n is 2, so that average is r cubed, so the optimal network will have a cube radius that is preserved. In other words, if the flow rate scales with r cubed, then the sum of the flow rates means that r cubed at every single branching pattern must be preserved, so the sum of all the small r cubes must balance the big r cube in the trunk. Okay? That is nothing but the statement of Murray's law proposed in 1926. Now, this apparently does not describe well trees, uh, even though there were several papers that made that case uh, very convincingly and very nice work. It, does, it is too high, yeah? too high. So, and I was intrigued because the work that John Sperry has presented was, was wonderful and uh, that, that got us a little bit to think about this topic. My first reaction was perhaps the metabolic rate was a little bit off. So let's see what, what might change if the metabolic rate is off. And I was thinking to myself, how can I reduce this factor 3 to make it more reasonable? And uh, what came to mind is Kleiber's law. Max Kleiber, a professor at University of California, Davis, who in fact uh, joined Davis in 1929 as a professor of animal husbandry. <laughs> at the time. Uh, so he was uh, an agricultural chemist and did wonderful experiments and showed that the metabolic rate as a function of mass appears to be a power law. Different intercepts but appears to be a power law. And the power law seems to be close to three-fourths. Now if you think of metabolic rate as a measure of your efficiency of using energy, yeah, then what Kleiber's law is saying is that if mass and metabolic rate scale linearly, this law is sublinear. That means that the bigger mass you have, yeah, the more efficient your energy consumption is yeah, relative to linear. And in fact, that argument was given to the fact that bigger animals live longer yeah, so, because they use energy more efficiently. And that's for a whole, whole set of debates in, in the science magazine about the three-fourths power law and 
fractal network that do that. But that's the essence of it, is that in the case of Kleiber's law, for a given mass, you are using, you have much less metabolic rates and you're using therefore your energy much more efficiently than a linear system. So this could, this could actually be one way to start reducing the metabolic costs. So if you were to revise, for example, Murray's law with Kleiber's law, the metabolic power scales with the mass to the 3 fourths. That's nothing but the density times the volume to the 3 fourths. Take the volume again as Murray did, multiplied by a length times the square of the radius. Assume the density is not fluctuating much as the radius in an evolutionary sense. So you get rather than PM raised to 2, now it is raised to 1.5. A rather disappointing adjustment because that means that the metabolic rate is only shrinking you from 12 over 4 to 11 over 4, still way far from anything that has been reported in trees. So, with, with, so what is really found in trees? Anywhere from 1.8 to 2.5. Okay, so that's roughly where things are. And Catherine McCullough and co-workers, this is the paper that really spurred this whole discussion, uh, it's a pretty interesting paper that appeared in Nature, uh, presented it, uh, they didn't go through, through Kleiber's argument, but, but they actually were trying to make the case that perhaps trees operate more along the lines of Murray rather than, than Leonardo. So is there a way from a fluid mechanics perspective to recover Leonardo's rule? Yes, if the velocity does not scale with the radius in the trunk or in any other organ, uh, then basically Leonardo would argue that the average velocity is r to the zero, while Murray would argue that the average velocity is r squared. That uh, immediately translates to a flow rate that varies with r to the fourth, while in the case of Leonardo, the flow rate would vary with simply r squared, the area, as, as he has done. And that means that the pressure drop will vary with the flow rate r to the minus one fourth. In the case of the hagen poisson equation, Leonardo would simply vary with r to the minus two. You put those together and you find that therefore the uh, hydraulic power uh, in the case of Murray would go to r to the minus fourth. In the case of Leonardo, it goes to r to the minus two. If you maintain the same metabolic rates, you will have the optimal network being n plus n over two. In the case of Leonardo, this be r squared as we have figured out, while in the case of Murray, of course, it was r cubed. If you really want to combine Leonardo and Kleiber, you get something like seven fourth. Okay. Now getting slightly better with Leonardo and Kleiber, but why? <laughs> uh, and this is the paper where Maculo and, and John Sperry and co-workers presented a very nice, uh, very nice argument for that. They said that animals actually, if you look at the bigger size, the transporting medium yeah, scales with the size. Okay. So if you have a big trunk, the water is actually flowing in a pipe that is also big. If you have a small branch, the water that is flowing there is also small. In the case of, uh, of a plant pipe model, basically your radius is not changing. You still have the same diameter of the pipe. The number of pipes is simply changing. That means that the size is independent of the radius of the pipe that is allowing water to flow, which is what Leonardo argued. <laughs> On the other hand, if you look at a plant aorta model, in fact, there is some scaling between the pipe that is flowing water and the branch size. Okay, so even though water is not flowing in the entire trunk, it's flowing in pipes within the trunk, these pipes scale with the size of the trunk. And in fact, Leonardo's argument is probably closer to reality than the plant aorta model. So that was one, one case. Interesting enough, after uh, Macula published their paper, there was a, a quite different alternative view that is not new, I have to say, even though it received a lot of attention, which is wind damage. Uh, Eloy, a physicist, published a paper in Physical Review Letters that made the statement that Leonardo's rule, in fact, has nothing to do with carbon water. This is all nonsense. You guys know, have no clue what you're doing. It all, has to do, it all has to do with wind loads. And he actually showed that to get a probability of equal fracture at every single junction, yeah, if you invoke Leonardo's rule, you get equal probability of fracture for strong winds. Which means that if you have a hurricane, you are likely to see equal probability of small branches and big branches collapse. No difference. This received also quite a bit of attention. Uh, so just for reference, Science Magazine had, a, had an article that was saying, well, what Da Vinci saw in trees. <laughs> 
Uh, Leonardo's formula explains why trees don't splinter, but perhaps the award-winning title goes to the Italian newspaper La Stampa that said cracking, which is really mechanical. <laughs> da Vinci's code on tree growth, yeah. Okay, so perhaps trees being confronted with hydraulics and structural issues, we've shown basically how the average exponent emerges as an optimum. If you add also some metabolic, uh, beyond the metabolic hydraulic issue, if you add some structural issues that tend to vary with size, the tree is likely to choose also the, <laughs> the average exponent, very similar to the arguments that, that we have. So trees are not optimum hydraulically, they're not perhaps optimum structurally, but they're somewhere close. So do these scaling laws really matter? In the end, we've discussed quite a bit, but, but do, they, do they have any impact on, on fluxes, which is really what we're interested in? And to answer that question, we started by looking at uh, a tree that has all the ingredients that you would like. It has a tapering. It has different branches of different sizes. And what we have done is we've treated this tree as a porous medium, so basically a Richards equation can be solved on this fractal structure. Optimization theory was used to allow the water to leave from the leaves. There was, of course, a critical pressure that if exceeded, the leaves will shut down, okay? Basically, to prevent cavitation, very much like what John Sperry has done. And then we invoke two scaling rules, one a little bit higher than Leonardo and one a little bit lower than Leonardo, and ask, what is the solution? How does the tree look like? Primarily in terms of stresses, because we wanted to see how the stress build up in terms of pressure distribution in the system behave as uh, you have a daily cycle progressing. And to do that, this is what comes up. So this is time during the day. We are now at around noon, so you see a lot of the red suggests that there is tomato shutdown, and then there is a recovery by the time, by the time you reach late afternoon. So that means that a tree like this would experience a midday stomatal closure, but then it will recover from this closure as time progresses. And by the time you start the next day, it's fresh. Okay? There is no, all its storage mem members are refilled. Let's see what happens if you happen to be below Leonardo now. So you're not as conductive as Leonardo. Again, we reach midday depression. Everything is closing, in this case, almost completely. And then you are beginning to slowly recover. By the 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you haven't fully recovered. So wait until the next day. You are starting with some stress buildup in the system. And as time progresses, you continuously build higher and higher stresses until until basically you cannot survive. And so that is not a realistic scenario. This tree would have died way back. Yeah? <laughs> but that is the sensitivity of these scaling laws to, uh, to basically what might happen in terms of stress distribution and, and fluxes of water. OK. So now that we've dealt a little bit with the vertical problem, let's look at the horizontal problem, which is biomass distribution on the landscape. Uh, in this case, we are interested not in height, but the optimum distribution of biomass. And in this case also, we are not interested in light, but we're interested in water. So we're dealing with semi-arid or arid ecosystems where water is the limiting resource, not photons. And we're going to look at a particular type of landscape, which is basically patent vegetation landscape. This is a picture taken from Google Earth of patent vegetation in Burkina Faso on a slope. You could see clearly that there is a, a structure here along the direction of the slope. Oh, this is moving on its own. Uh, in fact, there was a very nice paper by uh, Barbier and De Blau where they actually mapped where you see patent vegetation across the globe. Uh, this is taken from their papers and you see various uh, very coherent patterns in vegetation across the landscape. These are all taken from Google Image, so there is nothing, nothing fancy. And you see that they primarily occur in areas where you, know, you, have, you have dryness. You know, the West in the US, Africa, Australia. Yeah. These are the places where you see quite a bit of this type of patterning in vegetation. So what triggers this patterning and why do we care? Uh, Max Ritkirk in 2002 uh, presented a paper in Amnat that uh, made the case for why we should care. He argued that if we start with a completely uniform biomass distribution on the landscape and we start reducing the resource availability, in this case water, the morphology of the spatial pattern actually seems to be very coherent. You start with labernith and some dry spots, then you go to labernith, 
where now the vegetation is concentrated in only few places but a lot of dry areas then you go into a spotty pattern and once you reach that if you push it a little bit further you reach a stage where, which is often referred to as irreversible desertification and the reason it is irreversible is that if you reach the spot pattern or a little bit lower you need much more resources to revegetate okay and this is not likely to happen. And so the excess resources that you need typically prevent you from a revegetation state going from desertification back to a spotty, to, to a labor net pattern. And hence you reach a region that is called bistable uh, because on the way down, it's, it's okay. On the way back up to get revegetation, you need much, much more resources. And in fact, there was a picture that was shown again by Barbier in 2006, a very nice picture. They showed vegetation patterning in 1956 and then after droughts and grazing in 1996 this is how the vegetation looked like showing that we're beginning to approach for this particular ecosystem a stage of irreversible desertification we are actually at the position where we have labor net going to spots and in this case both factors grazing and soil moisture are, are contributing to the breakup of of vegetation patterns so what causes this vegetation pattern uh, well according to my and co-workers uh, this is a classic problem of competition facilitation the facilitation is happening on a small a small scale the competition is happening between scales in this case soil and vegetation and there is a global pressure on the system which is minimum available water precipitation you, know, you have to reach a phase where the biomass that you have on the landscape has to balance has to balance uh, the available water. So even if you are so efficient at grabbing all the water, uh, there's a certain amount of biomass that you could grow and then after that point you just need much more water than could be available to you. And what they said is that uh, if you have a strong infiltration contrast, yeah, you create a positive feedback. In other words, if you have more vegetation and you have higher infiltration capacity here, but lower infiltration capacity here, then the water that falls on the landscape suddenly just makes its way to the vegetated sites because of overland flow. Yeah, you have bare soil with a crust, water builds at the vegetated site, the water level is low. So basically you have something that looks like this. Over the site you have high water levels and that drops to where the vegetated sites are here to a low water level and that is what is driving water even on a flat terrain to move towards the vegetated site. So there is no slope even needed to do that. So this was the argument that Max Ritkirk did and he said it is because of this infiltration contrast that wherever you have vegetation you harvest more water, you concentrate the water at the vegetated sites and then you could grow more biomass. More than what you would have just seen if water just fell over the vegetated sites itself. So is there any merit to that? Well, Sally Thompson uh, did a, a, a large-scale synthesis work and tried to assemble all the possible experiments that had infiltration and biomass published in xeric sites. And what she has found is that, yes, there is a weak correlation uh, between biomass and log infiltration, uh, but significant. So that, that does suggest that this could be an important mechanism. So now the model itself, the model itself that uh, generates this type of patterning is a system of three partial differential equations. The first one is for biomass and this equation is fairly standard. You have a rate of growth of biomass with respect to time. Uh, that varies with photosynthesis basically. The photosynthesis is some maximum conductance multiplied by the biomass itself adjusted for available water. There's a certain death rate that is proportional to the biomass. But the important thing is to generate spatial patterning. You need movement and in the case of the Reed-Kirk approach they proposed a purely diffusive movement of biomass. In the case of water, they've broken up the water reservoir into two, surface water and soil water. Let me do the surface water first. The buildup of overland flow is the imbalance between rainfall occurring at the surface and the infiltration rate. The infiltration rate then depends on the available biomass. In other words, if you have a lot of biomass, you could infiltrate more. If you have just soil with a crust, you don't, you don't infiltrate much. And then in the case of uh, sloping terrain, they had a movement based on the ODX, but in the case of flat terrain, they switched magically to a diffusive representation. And so water basically is moving as a Laplacian, as a diffusive system. And uh, in the case of uh, the root zone soil water, they argued that whatever is infiltrating then goes into replenishing soil moisture. 
there is some losses, of course, due to plant water uptake that are up there, so this is the same term. There is some drainage, and they made the argument that water in the soil moves also diffusively in proportion to the gradient of water. That, this is nonsense, I mean, this is not soil physics, but okay, that's a toy model, okay? At, at the annual time scale, you could argue that the diffusivity is almost constant or linear, and so that might be not a decent, not a bad representation. But strictly from a physics perspective, that's not how water moves in the soil. N neither, neither it moves like this over land, by the way. <laughs> uh, okay, but let's revisit at least the more important one for the vegetation patterning, which is how vegetation moves. It's very rare that vegetation moves in a diffusive manner. And so what Sally has done is she has worked out uh, with, with me on dispersal of seeds in wind, in wind uh, dispersed species. And you could show that under some conditions you could derive an analytical solution to the dispersal kernel. And that turns out to be an inverse Gaussian or a wald. This is a power law that is censored by some exponential cutoff. So what she has done is she has removed the diffusion movement of biomass and added basically a kernel-based representation for biomass and solve the equation to really see what happens to biomass distribution on the landscape now for a given amount of water. In this case, the water is less than average for this ecosystem and then we will look at the case where the water is higher than average for this ecosystem in Niger, in fact. And so we start with a random seed distribution yeah, on the landscape and then start supplying water to this ecosystem and see what happens. And uh, basically this is the solution for the three equations that we have just seen with the biomass being displayed. And very quickly you see that, yes, a certain patterning system emerges. The vegetation is, is basically becoming more and more binary. So you either have very dry spot or very vegetated spots that are concentrated in small areas. Okay, uh, so let's contrast that with the wetter conditions. Now this is a little bit wetter, so you find that similar things happen. Now more of the landscape is actually vegetated compared to this one, and you don't peak at the same rates as this. So in other words, the tendency for the vegetation is to concentrate the biomass in smaller and, and smaller area. And if we, in fact, make this drier, we would have reached the spot pattern very quickly. Okay, so is that what happens in nature? It was rather interesting to see that in the case of re diffusive representations, you have something that looks like this. In the case of a kernel-based representation, your clustering in space is looking something like that. And that seems to be a little bit more disordered than that. Okay, so the minute you talk about disorder with the physicists, they get very excited about disordered media. So that basically resembles disordered media that tends to actually have much sharper fronts in fact, compared to diffusive, diffusive representations. And if you look at truly pictures from, from MODIS in terms of vegetation patterns in Niger, the case study here, you find that in fact, this type of disorder is much more coherent with these images than, than the diffusive representation. Yeah? Gabby, what, what's the, the spatial scales on this? Uh, 700 meters maybe, match. yeah, 700, 800, yeah, about. In fact, what, what Sally did is she started with initial conditions that look like this, and under the diffusive representation, that's what you get. <laughs> under the kernel-based representation, this is what you get as initial conditions. So you actually see whether the wavelengths are degrading or not. That's one way to test. So perhaps for us, uh, while we start looking at distribution of biomass on, on the landscape, uh, we would like to actually be able to study these patterns in a more controlled experiments, and we can ask the question whether we can replicate those patterns in labs. You know, why not? Why can't we build po pots, put some crust, and allow vegetation to move? Yeah, something like that. So can we do that in the lab? And to answer that, basically we're answering whether these patterns are scale-free. In other words, can I study a pattern that is on a scale of 750 meters to, to, to study patterns at 45 centimeters? And basically the answer that seemed to emerge from a whole set of journals, cover page incidentally, um, that seemed to suggest that the answer is yes. And in fact, the basic argument that has been given is one picture from one study on a grass site. Mm -hmm. Basically, that grass site has patterning that is on the order of 45 centimeters, while the patterning in Niger is on the order of 750 meters. So the argument is that, yes, it's a scale-free system. I can study these patterns in a lab without any problem, and hence I can explore these patterns without worrying about any scale. 
And so we could not reproduce this pattern. We tried very hard and we failed. And when we started going back to the primary evidence for it, we found that this pattern picture that was taken from comes from a larger picture which is shown here. And if you start inspecting this picture a little bit more skeptically, you find that at the places where you would have expected to see drier soil, there is actually a more lush vegetation. Check the edges, yeah? Next to the tree where you would have expected more competition between soil moisture of the rooting zone of the trees and the grasses, it seems that the grass there seems to be more lush. So is that really <laughs> the pattern formation that you would expect from carbon-water interactions with carbon being slave to water and water being limited? So that was exactly what's on our mind. And that is really the picture that you would see in most journals, the cover of science and so forth. And uh, while we were in this puzzle, lo and behold, Sally Thompson, my PhD student, one evening was coming out from the gym, it was around 10.30 or so at night. And next thing I know is that I was leaving the building and I see Sally zooming into the building and running to the lab. And I asked her, Sally, what's the hurry? She said, oh, I saw the patterns in the grass lawn in front of the gym. There. <laughs> so we were debating what could be the case. So Sally went and took, you know, this is the teachings of Richard Cuenca. You go, take a TDR system and you run to the field. And she actually measured the soil moisture content for the green patches and compared them with the soil moisture content for the brown patches. There was no relation, okay? The average soil moisture content for the two was about the same. So that's clearly not water that is causing this. And then, Sally was chatting to a physicist by the name of Karen Daniels at NC State, and she showed her those patterns and said, uh, Karen said, oh, but these look like convection. These are pictures of convective cells in porous media. And so I said, well, this looks really interesting. They look really like <laughs> vegetation patterns. So what may be happening? And so we framed a simplified picture for this, that cold air is coming above the grass, yeah? Then you have a sweeping event that brings cold air in and that actually damages the glass, grass blades. But when warm air gets ejected out because the soil is still warmer yeah, than the air, that protects the blades and you end up seeing this type of convective patterns because of ejections and sweeps of warm air, cold air. And we made some predictions about the wavelengths relative to the height of the vegetation and we showed that you need a minimum height to sustain this type of convection. And we, after some battle with uh, Amnat about the fact that you could have patterns other than Turin instabilities that pop up, you could have also patterns from convection. They didn't like it. We made the case and finally got it accepted. One year later, we see this picture coming from uh, a, a golf course at NC State where one part of the golf course was mowed to five centimeters. This is the minimum that you would need to get convection kicking. And another part of the golf course that was mowed to 1.5 centimeters where convection was purely suppressed. And that picture was almost the vindication of almost six months of fight with Amnat reviewers. <laughs> um, so with that, we were confident that this was the main mechanism that was explaining this fine scale pattern. That does not mean that the equations may not be scale free. It's just that the evidence that was given is not conclusive. So to, to summarize, uh, what we have done is we have shown that the leaf scale, maximizing carbon gain for a given water loss, seems to describe the optimal stomatal aperture reasonably well. It predicts correctly uh, some scaling relation between stomatal conductance and vapor pressure deficit. But the next phase is to try to link the Lagrange multipliers to something more physical, like leaf venation theories. This is still an open problem. At the tree scale, we have shown that there is some interesting cost-benefit analysis that can be framed a la Murray's 1926 paper. But the question is, can we, can we extend this type of scaling to other pieces? You know, what about the rooting system? This is a picture of the roots. Do they also follow Murray's law or Leonardo's law? And if not, why not? Are there really just structural differences that are preventing them? Or is there something more subtle about the hydraulics that we are not capturing? And finally, we looked at vegetation distribution on the landscape, and we have shown that, yes, vegetation does distribute to harvest the water very efficiently, but the issue of whether these vegetation patterning studies are scale-free or not remains to be explored further. And since I started the main talk with a quotation from Murray, I would like to end it with a quotation from Murray. And Murray, actually, in the same paper, he was trying to make the case that observations and Theories basically 
may, may assist us in deriving a more general theory about the systems. And he actually made a very convincing argument. He said, look, the laws of thermodynamics were known before the kinetic theory of gases was developed. So it is uh, not impossible that some quantitative generalization may be arrived at in physiology, which are independent of the discrete mechanisms in living things. We did not know why the laws of thermodynamics worked before the kinetic theory of gases. And in fact, we are still searching for similar laws in, in hydrology and ecology. But I think the approach that Murray has taken is not a bad one. He said that, yeah, you know, there are, there, they could be independent of living things, but which apply to organic systems considered statistically. So in other words, there could be more general laws that would pop up that are not dependent on the particulars of the system, very much like uh, thermodynamics was not very dependent on the specific heat engine that you were looking at. And with that, I conclude. Thank you. We have, we have time for a few questions. I want to remind people that there's the reception afterwards, so we can have some discussion points there as well. Yeah. Yeah, great talk. I'm, I'm really interested in Arctic ecosystems, yeah. and I'm, I'm gaining an appreciation for the boreal forest, which is the largest forested ecosystem in the world. And there, the I'm wondering if you can use this idea of Boreas laws and, and Da Vinci's laws to, to identify like the northern limit of tree line you know, in place, so like where that wouldn't work anymore for trees, you know. They, when, they're just, when you look at like the black spruce trees, mm -hmm. look at the radius of the tree, it's tiny. But they're, you know, and they get shorter as you go further north. But um, I mean, they're just very different things that happen with water in that environment. It's frozen and it's dry. And the trees have a really weird structure. It's almost as if they're trying not to collect snow on them, but to maximize the, the shadowing and um, reduction of turbulence around them in order to control that moisture resource to subsidize their moisture themselves like in, and develop that pattern in that right um, sense. I'm wondering if you or others might have looked well, at I, I have not, actually. Human yeah. Really yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. That's so an intriguing you problem. You predict, like, what, what the northern extent would be, or, like, where tree line would be. Right, I mean, the, the first reaction would be temperature, but, yeah, it could be also soil it's moisture. It's a water-limited environment. It's, yeah. like, maybe 300 millimeters. Right. But is it uh, more but controlled? It's water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's why maybe they're not growing. <laughs> well, yeah, but I know. But this time of year, they have like lots and lots of daylight mm -hmm. when they're not. Yeah, growing. yeah, yeah. And it's and it's uh, evergreen, yep. leaves, so they can photosynthesize whenever liquid water is present. I haven't thought about it too much. No, but yeah. that's that's a very good point. It'd be really interesting, different application than for a broadleaf deciduous tree. I mean, I need to think a little bit more about it, just because I don't know much the anatomy of uh, of the spruce. Okay. Yeah. But but yeah, that would be definitely interesting to look into it. That uh, that would be fun, we'll actually. <laughs> that would be really nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have an answer. Okay. <laughs> hey, homework for me. <laughs> so Gabby, um, when you look at this clumping and and you, you talked about the mechanism of getting soil. Uh, water to the roots. Yep. Is there also a thought process about how a clump of vegetation reduces the vapor pressure deficit of, of the leaves big by making itself bigger? Uh, I mean, we, we thought a little bit about, about this issue because you do have a, a small boundary layer that could be evolving over this patch mm -hmm. and that would have a different VPD than, let's say, the upper atmospheric VPD above the soil plant system. Mm -hmm. But honestly, these calculations were done on an annual time scale, so this <laughs> minor change was <laughs> not on the radar screen per se. I mean, it was really these models are, are, are toy models. Right. And we did spend some time before we did these calculations to green them. So in fact, we, we did put more realistic stomatal conductance models. We did put more realistic water routing models than this one. So now we do have actually a Manning type equation with a Sam Benan equation moving water into the vegetated site and really looking at the infiltration contrast in a more realistic way. So we did all of that, but still, you know, the general features of the patterns are driven by the apparent infiltration contrast between this and that. So you could tinker with it. What it does is it changes the time scale. It might change a little bit the size. It might change the size biomass kilograms of carbon per square meters on the landscape, but it's not changing qualitatively the, the overall picture. Um, it's still, it still seems to be driven by the hydrology <laughs> infiltration contrast. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. 
question. I mean, we gave the hydraulics quite a bit of kick because I thought it might be nice also rather than just the VPD. As water enters the vegetated system, yeah, it is experiencing a drag, so there is more ponding here mm -hmm. than perhaps later. And so, in oh, fact, yeah. the slowdown yeah. would actually allow the water to stay longer on the vegetated site and infiltrate. Mm -hmm. So we did all of that, and okay. it was a minor, all of them did turn out to be a minor tinkering that simply affected, you know, just the density, slightly the size. But if you shut off the infiltration contrast, everything goes away. <laughs> um, I'll go to the last question to uh, Really an interesting talk, really thought-provoking. I'm interested in the, the second part where you're talking about the branching patterns of trees and how, you know, the fact that, that the cambium layer of a tree is, is really a cylinder in which the, the vessel elements are put on, sometimes it, the, you know, the spring wood being larger and the later season wood being smaller, so that there is this also, not only is, is it a cylinder rather than uh, a pipe, like we're thinking, mm -hmm. which if you subtract the square, the radius of the cylinder, it's like yeah. you get the same thing, but, but, but at, the, at the finer scale, you also have the capacity to have small you know, uh, adjustments of how many vessel elements are produced as well as this plasticity within years that can oh, uh, that can provide absolutely that kind of a rapid response on top of the longer term you know hundred year response totally agree and these are two time scales and in fact the simulations that we that we were showing at the end were fixing that but in fact th this is this is something that should be added because in the end you're, so if we go to the simulations here, yeah. these simulations, they actually fix the structure and there is no elasticity in them. But in fact, if you're talking about water being stored and water being released later, I totally agree. We didn't take that into account. This will be fun actually to try that. I've, I've never, I've never delved into it deeply beyond uh, the provocative paper of John Sperry and, uh, and McCullough's work. And I was just curious to see why it was Murray and what is the controversy between Murray and Leonardo. That really spurs it and then how important are these scaling laws because in the end we would like to move into a system like this because these structures can be measured from remote sensing platforms uh, michael levsky actually at oregon state university has done quite a bit of work that did show the ability to recover quite a bit of the tree organ <laughs> from lidar measurements well i mean very impressive results so so that it would be nice to actually be able then to take something like that externally understand how the shape affects or relates to the internal vessels and you're right then is there elasticity to store water i mean the water is sitting in cells so there is definitely some expansion and contraction as as you're saying and and I, you know that that definitely is, is the way to go but what is now being done is replacing this entire system with an equivalent resistor capacitor network you know? i mean mathematically even the two are very different if, if you look at a resistor capacitor network you have an ordinary differential equation that is describing the current. If you look at something like that, you already have a partial differential equation, not to mention the scaling laws that are affecting the, the, the media. So I, I totally agree. There, is, there are exciting issues, but I think we need to move into this type of more realistic framework to think about water, how water is being stored, how the structure internally of the vessels are changing, how the connections of the vessels are, what happens, and this is uh, something that uh, Missy Holbrook at Harvard University has been looking at a lot. How do you recover from embolism? We still don't have a complete picture for that. <laughs> Once you have a cavitation, you know, the air bubble forms, there is no way to get rid of it given the fact that you are under tension all the time. Unless you have one-way valves that allow <laughs> water to go in but not air. <laughs> So, so th I mean, there is tons of uh, open problems that I think the interface between fluid mechanics and ecology, ecophysiology, is, is, is ready to it be done. explain some of the discrepancies between the scaling exponents and what would be expected if a, if a single hydraulic explanation is happening? Could be, yeah, could be. I mean, I, I agree. I, I was thinking more first whether it has to do with hydraulics or wind. I mean, that's the first one. Or, or light capture. <laughs> or light capture, yeah. What is limiting, and, and Anne's comment, too, is really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With respect yeah. to in some situations, right. is it really uh, uh, a, a three-pillar approach of temperature, moisture. Structures. Yeah. And to, to hold snow or not. And yeah. Yeah. Frost or not. 
So yeah, I mean, but these are, I think, the, the open problems that once they are identified, it allows you to bridge the structure with the function. Well, if you look at palm trees, which have what blue ones, yes, but they don't have that uh, difference. No, no, they don't. <laughs> Yeah. No, no, and no. So maybe by looking at the variability that's out there in the structure of the trees and what is limiting in each environment, it might be more possible to kind of tease apart the yeah. evolutionary pressure. pressures that allowed it to develop. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in this case, it was all assumed to be hydraulics, but yeah, I mean, structure, light, horizontal structure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, temperature, perhaps shading. Uh, so, yeah, I, mean, I, t I totally agree. But it would, the, the ability to see them now from, from very detailed aircraft measurements is there. So we need to start thinking about how this information can be used to improve the ability to predict stores and fluxes down the road and how these ecosystems might evolve under a, a changing climatic conditions, you know, with more stress due to soil moisture or temperature or CO2. And these are things that I think the structure will give us important information about how the ecosystem will evolve in the future. I mean, for example, other things like uh, how does elevated atmospheric CO2 changes uh, the hydraulic properties of the wood? If you are growing faster, <laughs> if you're putting more wood faster, does that change the hydraulic properties? We don't know. <laughs> okay, let's, let's thank Gabby one more time. Thanks.